Have you ever wondered what the gamma and radiation readings are at 33,000 feet? Well, I have. And so recently I took an airplane flight, two in fact, and I brought a small handheld dosimeter and gamma spectrometer with me. At 33,000 feet, the readings were lower than I suspected. So I spent a little bit of time examining my data and came up with some really interesting conclusions. Well, maybe not too interesting, but interesting enough. So let me see if I can kind of parse this together for you. And so here I am ready for my triumphant mission to the great blue yonder. Good grief. Alright, this is the dose rate before takeoff, 0 0.01 microsievert per hour. That's at sea level. Now here I am at 33,000 feet, and you notice the dose rate, well, it kind of went away there. The dose rate is approximately 0 0.49, 0 0.47, somewhere in there, microsieverts per hour which isn't too bad. It's actually a lot lower than I expected it would be. I thought it would be way, way higher, you know, like two or three microsieverts per hour. This is much lower than I, than I suspected. And when I looked at the gamma spectrum that I was taking, you can see how high up I am. I noticed that it, it wasn't quite as uh, large as I suspected. And so I figured I would just collect all the data I could, which I did, take it back to my hotel room when I got to where I was going and kind of look it over in detail. You see that peak right there? That's the dead giveaway, that little peak, and I'll explain in a minute why. That peak at 5.11 keV explains everything. My two-hour trip only exposed me to about 1.58 microsieverts. This seemed kind of low, and so I wondered why. All right, now as you can see right here from the spectrum that I took, uh, I took the spectrum uh, starting at probably around 15,000 feet. The peak was approximately 33 to 35,000 feet. And um, the, the, the total duration of the trip was approximately an hour and 40 minutes. And I received 1.5 microsieverts as a dose for that entire time, which is quite impressive, actually. I, 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 th I thought it would actually be higher, to tell you the truth, and well, that's just weird the way it all worked out. But anyway, let's look at the energy quickly. All right, so the bottom here, going from um, uh, left to, towards the right, is an energy. Notice that this is 3,484 uh, keV, and this is 37 keV, and this is counts, the number of counts I got. And of course, the cesium iodide detector is not very good for this kind of thing because the majority, as you can see over here, the majority of what I picked up was really high energy stuff over here, really high energy. You can see it's starting to go up right here. And that should tell you something since the actual um, probability of the detector detecting anything at this high of an energy is almost zero. So that's quite impressive, actually. This is the telltale sign there right here. Notice around 500, 513, somewhere there. This is actually a 511 kilo electron volt peak. What's happening is high energy particles, the ones that are over here, are slamming into the airplane at really, really high velocity with really high energy. And they're creating um, a positron, which is an anti-electron, and electron pairs. It's called pair production. And these, uh, the electrons are flying off different directions, but the positrons are flying off and they're hitting another electron and annihilating, producing two 511 keV photons. And here's one of them right here. Actually, it could be both for all we know. Can have an escape peak and some other stuff. It might be something at 1,022, right? Eh, somewhere in here. But anyway, the point of the matter is, I can't tell what most of this is. As you can see, it's really choppy looking. It normally doesn't look like this, but this is what it looks like at 33,000 feet. Quite impressive. Quite impressive. But right there, that is absolutely a positron annihilation peak from really high energy particles. Amazing. And look at the center peak right here at 279 keV. What the heck is this? Well, it's going to take me a little while to figure out what this is and how this huge peak arose. This is not my 75 keV 
uh, lead peak. Let me show where that should be. Normally I get the big peak right here at 75-ish, 75 to 80 kV, somewhere right around here. That's not what this is. I don't know what the hell this is. So we'll find out what some of these really powerful things are. And for all you Fukushima guys out there, none of this stuff has anything to do with Fukushima. Remember how everybody was saying that the radiation at high altitude was from Fukushima, which is just dumb because you can go look at books from the 1940s and 50s that talk about the high radiation of altitudes. But I guess they were grasping at straws or something. Uh, let's see, 662, 662 should be right around here. There's a little peak right there, but there's absolutely no peak down here to correspond with it for the 32 kV. So, and it's just like every other peak along here, so there's not really enough to call it anything. And certainly, even if it is there, it's not obviously even remotely the most prominent feature here. So, there you go. So, what does this tell us in the end? Well, I'll show you something here in just a second that's kind of neat. But what this tells you in the end is that the energy from the photons hitting the detector was so great that most of them were going through the polymaster and not being detected by the polymaster. That means my actual dose rate was, tr was, was, was much higher probably, most likely, than what was actually shown, unfortunately. So this means that A, the polymaster is not particularly accurate at high altitudes because that's not what it was meant for. It was meant for more terrestrial energy levels. But number two, um, it also means that the uh, energy of the gamma rays goes up tremendously as you go up. So this kind of supports, of course, the idea of cosmic background, which of course doesn't need to be supported. It's well known and understood by science. And yeah, I'm going to show you something neat in just a second. Um, but um, it also shows you there isn't really anything going on up there with Fukushima. Now, there is contamination in the clouds, don't get me wrong, not just from Fukushima, but from Chernobyl, from Windscale, from Three Mile Island, well, probably not much from that anymore, but a little bit, and um, plenty from the nuclear bomb testing that was done over all those years. But even as much as there is up there, and there's plenty, don't get me wrong, it's not enough to even be detectable in a gamma spectrometer. And so it's so however much of it there is up there, it's obviously not the major contaminant that's uh, detectable at high altitudes. Because I've heard people try to claim that that's why radiation readings on planes are high. Of course, that's nonsense. Let me show you, let me give you my teaser then. When my detector right here, as you can see the time, when it went through the x-ray machine at the airport, um, I mean, I can't cut the thing off. It's not my fault. It went through the x-ray machine. It was kind of funny. Um, the building uh, had a lot of granite in it, so here's me going through the granite. Granite, 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 granite. And then all of a sudden, these are a micro R. So micro rentgen, which is a very, very tiny amount. Itty bitty bitty bits of radiation. Even 180 micro R is not very much at all. It's very, very small. Uh, but then suddenly, it hit the x-ray machine. And I'd like you to notice that it went uh, from... It went from uh, micro R to 33.028 uh, mil millirentgen per hour. So that's uh, 330 microsieverts per hour. Ooh, my God. Don't you think that's a lot? I'm glad I didn't go through the x-ray machine. That would have sucked. But anyway, so that's all I can tell you about taking a gamma spectrometer in an airplane. Piles of fun. So I'll see you guys in the friendly skies and when I get back well there you go